She's the queen's only daughter. To many, the princess who symbolizes the best of the royal family. I think a lot of people in this country think that Anne would actually make a great queen. She has made a formidable monarch, without a doubt, because it is duty before self, and Anne is the personification of that. But as she turns 70, how well do we really know Anne? Well, I'm not totally useless. I was quite well educated in one way or another. How has her relationship with her family defined her? Princess Anne was the son that Prince Philip never had. She is very much in his image. And what is she really like? <laughs> she doesn't tolerate fools. She can be snappy. She can reduce grown men to tears. How does it feel having a Buckingham Palace as your private property? I don't know, because it isn't. She doesn't care about being popular. She doesn't care about rubbing people up the wrong way. We reveal the truth behind her most memorable moments from the dramatic. Good evening. There's been an assassination attempt on Princess Anne and Captain Mark Phillips. It was an extraordinary incident, and she handled it in the most extraordinary way to the controversial these were love letters there was something going on between the two of them we follow the highs and lows of an extraordinary life she might not be about hugs and cuddles and compassion but she is about duty and responsibility and hard work she's still making headlines after seven decades in the spotlight but is she the best queen we the Princess Royal. Born in August 1950, Princess Anne is the only daughter of Queen Elizabeth II and the Duke of Edinburgh, and sister to Charles, Andrew and Edward. Anne was born 70 years ago, the second child of Elizabeth, and of course when she was born, her grandfather, George VI, was still on the throne. And it really was a million miles away to where society is today. Arriving at Ballater Station with her family, the Queen was received by the Marquis of Aberdeen. Anne had a very 19th century childhood, a very traditional royal childhood. When she was born, of course, the Queen was not yet Queen. She was still Princess Elizabeth. So Anne was not born at Buckingham Palace, as many people think, but actually at Clarence House, where the then Princess Elizabeth and Prince... Older and heir to the throne, it was Anne who was assertive from a young age. Anne's always been a tomboy. She's always been the one who goes out and climbs trees and is very courageous and very confident, very willing to explore the world and find her own way in the world. In a way, perhaps that Charles has been a little more timid, a shyer, more sensitive character. Anne is absolutely a chip off the old block. As a child, even though she was a couple of years younger than the Prince of Wales, she was quite happy to take him on in any kind of physical rough and tumble. And she often came out on top. One person with a better insight into Anne than most is Katie Nichol. She recently interviewed the princess to mark her 70th birthday. I think growing up with three brothers, it was inevitable that Anne was going to be pretty tough, pretty resilient. She had to learn from an early stage how to hold her own as a girl in the royal family, second born to Charles. And, you know, I think there was a lot of competition between the siblings. So Anne was always going to have stake out her own role in the royal family. The princess had to become independent from an early age. She was not even three years old when her mother became queen in 1952. You have to remember that Anne was the daughter of a working mum, which in those days was not that usual. And she had a very hard working mum. Elizabeth was away a huge amount. I mean, Anne was tiny when her mum and dad went off for six months around the Commonwealth. So she and Charles were left, not exactly to fend for themselves, but they were largely brought up by nannies and governesses. Growing up, Princess Anne spent much of her time separated from her family. Anne had quite a solitary childhood in many ways because uh, she had her brother Charles and then there wasn't another sibling for a further 10 years actually. So it was herself and Charles at home being educated at home until Charles went off to boarding school and then there was just Anne and she was left with her governess for I think the best part of seven years. But it must have been a very strange existence. 
I think growing up as a young girl and did have quite a different childhood to previous royal children. Initially, she was homeschooled as all royal children were, but she was desperate to go to school. She wanted to get out. She wanted to discover life beyond the palace walls. You know, she had a brain. She wanted to go and learn. Up until this point, all British female royals had been homeschooled, but Anne broke the mold. She was the first princess to go off to ordinary school, if you like, very posh school, very posh indeed. But she fitted in very well. I think she enjoyed life as a boarder at this school with other young girls to lark around with. Wasn't brilliantly academic, much more interested in sport, much more interested in horses, of course. She was an independent little girl from a very early age and, you know, to a degree, had to become quite a grown-up child quite quickly and wasn't that commitment to duty, you know, what she saw her mother do. She was the daughter of a working queen. I'm sure that has all contributed to the woman Anne grew up to be. But unlike her mother, the princess was never destined to be queen. In a way, it's quite sad because you have this amazing kind of role model in her mother who was a very strong woman, a very powerful woman, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, which was kind of post-war, when women's rights and equality was really, really starting to take off and be incredibly important. And her mother was a great role model. And in some ways, it's a shame that Anne wasn't born first. But even if she had her been first, the rules back then, the law of primogeniture back then meant that any boy, any son born to a monarch would always take precedence over his sister. Because of the rule of primogeniture at the time, Anne's brothers all overtook her in the order of succession. When she was born, she was third in line to the throne after her brother and her mother. Grandfather was then still the king. And then when Princess Elizabeth ascended to the throne, Anne obviously moved up. And for many years, she was number two to Charles. But obviously things changed when the Queen had that second burst of motherhood with the arrival of Prince Andrew in 1960 and then four years later Prince Edward in 64 and moved down below her brothers. That was the system then. A lot of people have never been very comfortable with it, but that's how it was. And I think Anne accepted it. Princess Anne discovered that there were advantages to not being the heir. She knew that she was never destined to be Queen and it meant that she was spared a lot of the upbringing that her brothers had to go through. She was allowed a little more freedom. She was able to do what she wanted to do, wear the kind of clothes she wanted to do, see who she wanted to see. It was a degree of freedom, encouraged, I have to say, in part by her parents. Throughout her life, the princess has continued to be pushed further away from the throne. So she's now 14 in line to the throne. She's sit down behind her brothers, Edward and Andrew, their children, and then of course, the children of Princess William and Harry. So she is currently 14th in line to the throne and therefore very unlikely to ever become queen herself. I think playing second fiddle to Charles and then being leapfrogged in line to the throne by of course Andrew and then Edward and subsequently pushed further down the line of succession. I think Anne very much wanted to create a role for herself within the royal family and to break free, particularly of Charles's shadow. She may have fallen down the line of succession, but many believe Anne is number one in her father's eyes. Well, it's long been rumoured that you know, the Queen's favourite son was always Andrew and being the only daughter, so very possibly there was some favouritism from Philip to his daughter, and I think she's always looked up to her father. We know that Charles found it difficult, found it difficult being the eldest son, found it difficult being Prince Philip's son, but there wasn't quite the same pressure on Anne. As she grew older, Anne's similarities to her father brought them ever closer. I've always thought that Princess Anne was the son that Prince Philip never had. She is very much in his image, and I think that is what he wanted Charles to be. And Charles was a very sensitive child who grew into a sensitive man who is emotional. Anne is none of those things. Anne is very straightforward, very blunt, calls a spade a spade, but is also very funny. And her father is very funny. And I think they have absolutely the same sense of humour. Does the press really annoy you? Do you know something? Um, yes, I think it does. I think okay. that it, would be very, it wouldn't really be doing its job if it wasn't. Both of them can be quite grumpy, both of 
them can be quite difficult. Both of them shoot from the hip, both of them say what they think, both of them are kind of keep calm, keep buggering on, and both of them have a really strong work ethic. Anne's early work ethic would stand her in good stead for her royal future, but would her strong character lose her favour? And how did she upset America as a teenager? She looked at the time as though she didn't want to be there, they said. She refused to answer anyone's questions, snappily saying, I don't give interviews. She doesn't tolerate fools. She can be snappy. She can reduce grown men to tears. May God bless her and all who sail in her. Princess Anne's incredible work ethic was evident from a young age. In 1968, aged just 18, she became a working royal. I think she's always had a sense of commitment from a very early stage in her life. And after school, she decided that rather than go to university, she wanted to start working and becoming a full-time working royal. And that's exactly what she did. Anne didn't see the point of any further education. She'd had quite enough by the time she was 18 and said that she thought university was a very overrated pastime. She probably wouldn't have got in anyway because she didn't do brilliantly in her exams. I decided after my limited school career not to go to university. Um, contrary to some reports, not because I couldn't go to university. <laughs> but I didn't actually want to go to university. When the Queen and Philip went to Australia in 1970, Anne wasn't even 20, she was still only 19. She accompanied them and it was the birth of what has become a real royal staple, the royal walkabout. There had never been a walkabout before, but such was the interest in the young teenage Princess Anne, and she was a very mean and attractive teenager. The crowds turned out in their thousands. The princess has devoted a large part of her life to official engagements and is often referred to as the hardest working royal. She always has been one of, if not the most hardworking member of the royal family. I mean, she will carry out four or five engagements in one day. She could be in Scotland in the morning, London in the evening, and she will be very well briefed on every engagement and extremely professional. She's admitted she's a workaholic. Anne is very no-nonsense, and she takes that approach to her work. She regularly tops the best-selling um, list in terms of her highest number of engagements. I think on an average year, she does anything from 350 to at most 500 engagements, both domestically in the UK and abroad. It's a huge workload. I remember Kevin MacLeod, who was the Canadian Secretary to the Queen, said of Anne in 2014, her credo, her literally her belief is, keep me busy, I'm here to work, I'm here to do good things, I'm here to meet as many people as possible. Anne may work hard behind the scenes, but for many years, this has been eclipsed in the media, all due to her troublesome relationship with the press. This was apparent from her first visit to the United States in 1970, when the princess was just 19. One of her first foreign trips was to America, where she and Charles went together. And she was not very well received there at all. She went to the White House to visit Nixon, when he was president. And there was a lot of negative press because she seemed to be so sulky. She looked at the time as though she didn't want to be there, they said. She refused to answer anyone's questions, snappily saying, I don't give interviews. She was very ungracious. It was very much noted that Anne didn't seem to have the friendly, soft, smiling face. She was wound up being dubbed Princess Sourpuss. The Americans said, why did she bother to come? It's quite clear she doesn't want to be here. So that was the beginning, actually, of pretty much a lifetime of often negative headlines for the princess. This early trip set a pattern for Anne's relationship with the media. There are probably members of the press, photographers particularly, who have perhaps been on the receiving end of Anne's shortness, shall we say. She can have a quick temper and she and not worry about a press pack there to capture every moment and some of those moments were certainly unexpected in 1969 while visiting troops in germany the world saw another side to the princess we were kind of all knocked out when she was 19 and she went to germany on a job 
and then um, we were getting pictures back of her. She is the holder of a heavy goods vehicle license, and we saw her driving a 52-ton chieftain tank. Astonishing. She also, on that same trip, she fired a submachine gun from the hip and got eight bullseyes. And I think there will be lots of men looking at her in, in abject terror. This, here she was, a young woman, and she was capable of doing all of this. Despite Anne's refusal to play the media's game, she was working hard to support the Queen. Those in the know even regard the princess as the royal family's secret weapon. And I think Anne has always realised her power, her soft diplomacy, the ability to help, the ability for the royal family to reach areas that, you know, traditionally prime ministers can't. You know, the royal family is a constant, they are always there. And particularly in areas of the world that have royal families, for instance, like the Middle East, when you send a member of the royal family to them on a state visit, it's immensely important. It conveys, you know, huge prestige. And people take that very seriously. And often the royal family, like Anne, are used to help trade deals, help diplomatic relations. And I think Anne has been very successful at that. And she's done that from a very young age. Well, Anne had this brilliant knack of sort of being uh, the pathfinder, if you like, for the royals. There was a slightly tricky destination go to. It was always Anne they would send in first because she has a great ability at making people feel welcome and being enormously empathetic with people. In 1990, it was Princess Anne who the Queen trusted to visit the Soviet Union on her behalf. This historic occasion marked the first official visit by a member of the royal family in over 70 years. The last, coming before the Tsar, a distant relative of the Queen, was executed after the 1917 revolution. I suppose her most significant overseas trip was to Soviet Russia, as it then was, in 1990. How does it feel having a Buckingham Palace as your private property? <laughs> well, I don't know, because it isn't. <laughs> She made a huge impact. It was a great success. Big crowds came out to see her. People were interested in her. And the feedback was incredibly successful and very positive for Britain. That was a massive deal in terms of the thawing of the relations between the UK and Russia. So that was a really, really important tour that Princess Anne went on to the Soviet Union. And she really paved the way for the Queen's visit. Her daughter to step in. And despite Anne's stern reputation, she may even be welcomed in place of the Queen. The Queen can be very, very shy. She's naturally quite shy on engagements, whereas Anne is far more like Philip. So if you've got Anne on an engagement, you're going to get possibly a little bit more of a relaxed engagement. Anne isn't afraid to talk. You know, she will have banter. She will ask questions. She will engage in a way that I don't think we see the Queen do. When you watch engagements with the Queen, they tend to be very formal. Um, the Queen doesn't say very much, she's shown around and, and she observes, she may ask occasional questions, but with Anne, I found the engagements to be a lot more informal. As well as her royal duties, Princess Anne is involved with countless charities, organisations and military regiments in the UK and overseas. It's not just the public engagements, she is involved in a huge amount of charities, some 300 charities, some of which she's founded herself. She writes her own speeches, she has a very small staff. Well, yeah, Charles famously has a lot of staff looking after him. It's a big operation, being the Prince of Wales. When you look at the charities and patronages that Anne represents, you will see her interests reflected in those charities. So whether it's charities supporting the armed forces or veterans, that's a major issue for her. Carers Trust, which actually she established. Animal welfare charities, equine charities, they have a meaning to her where she feels she can bring something unique and helpful in her role. She's never seen the point in being just a nominal head of an organization, which is why she works so phenomenally hard. It would be almost impossible to go and visit every single charity and organization she's involved with every year, but she does her damnedest to do so. She believes that if you're going to put your name to it, it needs to be more than just a, a name on a letterhead. You actually have to go along, see what they're doing, encourage them and bring what publicity you can to them. One charity that has always been close to Anne's heart is Save the Children, and she's willing to take great risks in order to help. If you want to improve the lot of children, then you must improve the lot of their mothers. If there is a fundamental baseline for the Save the Children Fund's work, it is working with mothers and getting mothers to be able to take a much greater part 
um, in their children's lives and in the, in the lives of the community in which they live. I think she's very closely associated with the Save the Children Fund. She's been president for, I think, nearly 50 years now, and this has meant a very great deal to her. When Princess Anne carried out those early trips to Africa with Save the Children in the early 70s, this was her really breaking the mould. This was her going far afield, doing something that was at times quite dangerous. Um, the areas that she was going to were well, these visits to Africa would save the children long before Princess Diana was even on the scene. But Anne made it clear that she didn't seek praise from the public or the press. She once told a friend who had been asking her about the, the kind of affection that Diana had from the public, the love, the adoration that Diana had, if she would want that. And she said, no, she would rather have respect than affection from people that she didn't know. But again, Anne's refusal to cooperate with the press meant that much of her hard work went unrecognized. If she was off some tour raising money for an awareness for Save the Children and Diana appeared somewhere in a low-cut dress, the newspapers would be full of stories about Diana and Anne would find herself not getting a look in. I think that must have been very galling for her. In the early days, I used to wonder why she didn't force herself to have a better relationship with the press. She clearly you know, had no time for it at all. And she thought we were a nuisance. Such a shame because whenever we used to write about her, it wasn't about the worthy work that she'd done. It was because she'd lost her temper somewhere. She'd sworn at someone or because she was wearing ridiculous clothes. She got a really hard time from Fleet Street in the 80s and the 90s. They thought that she treated the press with disdain. She wouldn't talk to them. She ignored them. She wouldn't smile for them. And in return, they gave her a really hard time because in their view, she didn't give an inch. For many journalists of that time, Anne wasn't helping her own cause. She wanted to be appreciated for what she'd done. She got across that the Diane was more appreciated than her. And yet she did nothing to facilitate that. But this all changed in 1982, when the press followed Anne on one of her trips to Africa with Save the Children. They went in an attempt to get a story about her love life. But after realizing she wasn't going to talk, they started to take note of her work and were surprised at what they saw. There was one particular tour where she went to Africa and the photographers for the press pack were with her as well for all that time. It was probably weeks and she was visiting refugee camps in Africa. The press didn't really want to go along with her, but they did in 1982 go to Africa with her. And there they saw a princess who was utterly prepared to get down and dirty, really getting down to work, dressed, you know, in jeans and a, a shirt and probably a headscarf, in dusty, hot, sweaty Africa, going into slums, in a way we're not used to seeing a princess at all. And the tone changed and suddenly there were positive headlines and the good headlines such as she had not had at all before. And I think people began to appreciate that we had a very hard-working princess there who would travel the world and not stand on airs and graces. With a new understanding of her work behind closed doors, it doesn't tolerate fools. She can be snappy. She can snap at Lord Lieutenants, for instance, who are trying to keep her to a table. She can reduce grown men to tears. She, she's very like her father in that respect. And she is a very, very hard worker and wonderful at what she does. Very straight. She is what she is. And she's always said, actually, I've got to be true to myself. I am what I am. And that is a slightly haughty, imperious at times princess, but someone not at all snobbish and someone with a common touch, albeit a common touch that often was wearing white gloves but you know you can't take it away from her she is a hard-working royal but it's not only Anne's Olympic work ethic that has astounded the public she's had a whole other career with highs we had a world-class sportswoman as a working royal and that's quite unusual and lows it's pretty humiliating to be seen mud and water and scrambling after your pony. Anne might have been hard working when it came to royal duties, but it wasn't the only thing she dedicated her energy to. 
She was a senior royal, but she was also having a second career, effectively running parallel at the same time. Breaking with tradition, she chose to also pursue a riding career alongside royal duties. It's really very impressive that Anne was able to juggle her equestrian career as a very successful horse rider and carry out all her duties as a senior royal. Anne's lifelong passion for horses started from a young age. She probably sat on a horse before she could walk. She's utterly horse mad. Her father once said of her, if it doesn't fart or eat hay, Anne's not interested. And I, I think that's almost right. Horses have given her an escapism. Not only did they enable her to embark on a career outside of, of her role within the royal family, they provide daily escapism. I think nothing makes Anne happier than riding out, being, being in the paddock, being around horses. Horse eventing has long been considered a risky sport. And Anne's royal title did not give her any immunity to the dangers. Anne narrowly escaped serious injury following a bad fall whilst competing in Dorset. The ground and the horse came over on top and rolled, rolled on top. She was unconscious when I got there. It was later learned that Princess Anne had cracked a vertebra. Growing success in her equestrian pursuits led to an increased level of press interest in Anne, much to the dismay of the young princess. When they were photographing her when she was riding at events, when she was doing cross-country, and they would be tucked behind a fence, and they would like nothing more than to see her fall off her horse. It was generally thought that this year's cross-country course at Burley would present no more than a reasonable test for horse and rider. Not so. The 20th jump over a tree trunk into the water at the trout hatchery proved to be too much of an obstacle for most of the 60 competitors, not least for Princess Anne. And that was where she originally, the phrase that she's been tagged with ever since, where she told photographers to naff off. Anna's always uh, spoken her mind and she can be quite abrupt. It wasn't really naff off. Her language can be quite fruity. She hated the intrusion of the press, uh, as she saw it, uh, when she was trying to concentrate on riding. I mean, it's pretty humiliating to be seen covered in mud and water and scrambling after your pony. But she'd always get, get back on straight away, even after some of the worst tumbles. Anne's stoic attitude, however, won her admiration. If she fell off her horse, she was going to get back up and get back on that horse and prove that she could take the next one. And I think that that is a metaphor really for how she has approached her royal life with steely determination and resolute commitment. The inevitable falls captured by an eager press corps did nothing to detract from Anne's formidable talent. In 1971, at the European Horse Trial Championships, the 21-year-old princess wowed the equestrian world. 1971 was one of her great equestrian years, I suppose. She competed in the three-day uh, event, uh, the European Championships, and she won. That was absolutely fantastic for her. And sporting success allowed the public to see a different side of the princess. She was voted the BBC Sports Personality of the Year, which is always one of the greatest uh, accolades you can have as, a, as an athlete, as a sports person. So there in front of hundreds of other top, top people in their sports, she was fated as the top woman. It was a way of actual personality of the year, probably in many ways made Anne more relatable to the British public than she ever had been. Princess Anne's riding career reached its peak when, in 1976, Anne was chosen to represent her country on the biggest sporting stage possible. Anne took part in the 1976 Olympics in Montreal as a member of the British team riding the Queen's Horse Goodwill in the eventing category. Competing in the Olympics, which I suppose was the biggest moment of her equestrian career, didn't go absolutely brilliantly, unfortunately. It was a team event and we didn't win. 
didn't even get a medal, but they were there and they did compete. This was the first time ever that a member of the royal family competed in the Olympic Games, and it was a huge achievement. She earned a great deal of uh, praise and admiration, both uh, in the world of sport, but generally, nationally. We had a world-class sportswoman as a working royal, and that's quite unusual. Anne's achievements earned her the presidency of the British Olympic Association and a lifelong involvement. I think one of Anne's greatest successes in terms of British sporting history was bringing the Olympic Games to London in 2012. The Princess Royal led the well-known delegation, carefully carrying the flame inside a miner's lamp. Sebastian Coe has said that we actually owe her a, a bigger debt than most of us realise for having secured the London Olympics in 2012. Once again, she showed this character. She, she believes in something and she takes it on. She will give 100% and more. The 2012 Games are on. She went to pretty much every event she possibly could during the 2012 Olympic Games in London and around the UK and really was the figurehead. Anne's dedication and leadership aside, the Olympic Games were also associated with a more personal moment in the princess's life. While at the Mexican Olympics in 1968, a young princess Anne was introduced to a fellow rider and Olympian, Mark Phillips. Anne's pursuit of equestrian excellence didn't just kind of lead her to professional glory, it also led to her personal happiness as well. It was through the mutual love of horses that she met her first husband, Captain Mark Phillips, a lieutenant in the first Queen's Dragoons Guard. Of course, in her world of horses, Anne met quite a lot of dashing young men. She went out with quite a few of them. She went out actually with um, Andrew Parker as well, quite incidentally, but she, she was very keen on him. Her eyes finally set on Margaret as an equestrian athlete. Everyone, I suppose, was looking for the princess to find a, a suitable husband, someone maybe from the foreign royal family, someone of a similar background, a, a prince who might be knocking around somewhere in the world. Uh, but she wasn't having any of that. Uh, she was determined to marry uh, whoever she fell in love with. And the man she fell in love with was Mark Phillips. Determined that their courtship remained private, Anne was careful to keep her blossoming relationship from the press. We found out that she used to ferry Mark around in a horse box to secret locations so they could be together without anyone seeing. Well, there was, I think, an inherent distrust of the press on Anne's part. So when she did get engaged to Captain Mark Phillips, um, she made a point of outfoxing the media. Has it been a great strain keeping it secret and indeed keeping it away from people like <laughs> I think it has, yes, it became rather a strain. Yes. It did annoy the press a great deal because at that time the rumours were knocking around that uh, she was going to get engaged, she wasn't engaged, she was going to get engaged to Mark Phillips, and the palace denied it, denied it, denied it. And the day after they denied it, the engagement was announced, which uh, annoyed the press a great deal. The engagement was formally announced on the 29th of May 1973, with the wedding to take place in the November. royal wedding fit for a princess and a shocking kidnap attempt in november 1973 princess anne married mark phillips with all the pomp and ceremony of a royal wedding i think had she been able to have had things her way, it probably would have been a low-key wedding, but she was the first of the Queen's children to get married, the only daughter, um, so it was going to be a big deal. Yeah, we can see room. Captain Mark Phillips. Even though it was November, like her mother's wedding, almost 50,000 people lined the streets to watch her go to Westminster Abbey. An estimated 500 million saw it on TV. A royal wedding has always cheered people up and in this, as in everything else, Princess Anne, when pushed, delivered. Oh, 
are the best man, Captain Eric Grounds, puts the ring on the Archbishop's prayer book. It's for the blessing. She probably didn't like very much the fact that she had to get married in Westminster Abbey with all the, the glitz and the glamour, uh, the fairy tale princess. She has always felt, I think, rather lacking in that. Um, she that people imagine, and you know, maybe she feels she's been a bit of a disappointment, but that's just not in her nature. There were a few concessions to Anne's taste and personality. The wedding dress didn't come from a famous designer. It came from her own regular dressmaker. And the cake was made by the Army Catering Corps. The moment we've all been waiting for, and how lovely she looks. Now, we expected something quite different, and we certainly got it today. Look at that wonderful girl. The dress was very simple, very demure. The bouquet was very demure. It was all pretty low-key, and I think that was very much Anne's choice and uh, very reflective of, of how she wanted things handled. You know, she's not one who is comfortable in the spotlight, particularly when it's on her personal life. The bit I love about the wedding dress, it was this beautiful medieval looking dress cut from one piece of fabric apparently, but none of us could see it. But on the shoulders, apparently, there were little epaulettes just sketched in pearls, a kind of gesture to a uniform. Even Princess Anne couldn't go down the aisle on her father's arm in uniform, but she got as close as she could. So, the bride and groom come out, and you can hear the welcome from the crowd. Tradition has it that the Queen often bestows new additions to the royal family with a title upon their marriage. It was in the Queen's gift to bestow an earldom on Captain Mark Phillips, who was a commoner. He refused that title, and very much with Anne's blessing. And I think from the outset, they were determined to live as normal private lives as possible. It looks as if that was partly a way of saying that Mark Phillips himself did not really want to take rank within the royal establishment. She grew up with possibly what was the burden of having a title. You know, she had by this stage moved down the line of succession. She would have known that any children that she and Mark Phillips had would, without a title, perhaps have a better opportunity at having normal lives, the chance to create independent lives of the royal family and to be their own people. The newlyweds were barely able to enjoy the first months of married life before their peace was shattered when Princess Anne and her new husband were the target of Princess Anne and Captain Phillips. Perhaps one of the most defining moments in Princess Anne's life was when somebody attempted to kidnap her. They escaped, but four people were hit one serious. Good evening. There's been an assassination attempt on Princess Anne and Captain Mark Phillips. Their car was forced to stop by a Ford Escort on the Mall. Uh, the driver of the Escort, Ian Ball, jumped out and began firing a pistol at Princess Anne and her police protection officer. He shot several people, including Anne's police protection officer, who immediately got out of the car to confront him, and he shot her chauffeur. Amateur boxer Ronnie Russell was passing as the incident was unfolding. And I see a police officer coming over from the Queen Mother's house towards the car. I thought, that's it. It's all over now. That's the police. It's done and done with. There'll be no more now. And then as he arrived at the car, I saw the bloke just turn around and shoot him. I mean, you can't do that. You don't stand for that. You ain't getting away with that. And so I struck him at the back part of the head. He just turned and fired at me. That missed me, went through the windscreen of a taxi coming down the bow. Ball's intention was to kidnap Princess Anne and ransom her for millions and millions of pounds. The danger Anne faced was grave as the gunman gained access to the princess. The window's all smashed in. There's a gun on the floor. He's got another gun in his hand. He's got Princess Anne by the arm, pointing the gun at her head. And he's saying, come on in, you've got to come. You know you've got to come. When the kidnapper tried to make her get out of the car, she said, not bloody likely. 
This was no damsel in distress. She refused to get out of the car for Ball and told him that she was absolutely not going to do what he said. She said it later, talking about incident, she was scrupulously polite, but she was not going to do what he said. Well, then they had a tug of war going on, and I could see that she was breaking the grip with him. I leaned into the car. I said, come this way, Anne. You'll be safe. I got by the forearms, held him out, out of the car, in front of me. And I said, now we're going to walk away, and he's going to have to go through me to get you. At that point, he has run round behind me. Mark Phillips has seen that, dragged her back into the car. So when I've turned round, he's there now. He's like as far away from me as you are, and he's standing with a gun pointing at me. And I thought, well, it's your turn or my turn. And then I hit him very, very hard. Thankfully, the incident was brought under control by the arrival of the police on the scene. It was an extraordinary incident, and she handled it in the most extraordinary way. And the next day, she was back on duty, working as if nothing had happened. Just the same kind of attitude as if she'd just fallen off a horse, that he'd been terrified. That gives you some insight into the princess's pretty tough steely and unflappable nature and even when she's being threatened and at gunpoint she doesn't actually lose her cool it's another way in which she almost echoes her mother because with her mother there had been that apparently shot fired at her at the trooping the color ceremony and the queen just steadied her horse burma and went on and in much the same way princess anne kept on trucking Later on, her father, the Duke of Edinburgh, said that if the kidnapper had got away with Princess Anne, poor him, she'd have really made him sorry for it. And I think we all like that about Princess Anne. Following the foiled kidnap attempt, the royal couple went back to life as normal. Princess Anne and Captain Mark Phillips welcomed their first child, Peter, in 1977, followed by their daughter, Zara, in 1981. Both children were raised without royal titles and away from the royal spotlight. Zara has said on many occasions that not having a title gave her enormous freedom. That's what Anne wanted. She wanted her daughter to be a normal teenager and to get into the kind of scrapes the teenager did. And Zara absolutely has gone her own way. Peter and Zara are incredibly down to earth. You know, they don't even speak in the same way as many, many senior royals. You know, there's nothing pompous about them at all. I think they're great young people. Princess Anne's vision for her children was to pay off when in 2012, she awarded her own daughter a silver medal at the London Olympics. Princess Anne's insistence that her children be shielded from the demands of a royal title was a position not shared by all her siblings. Andrew rather pompously has insisted on full status for his girls who are both princesses and Edward's children too do have titles. So she's very different on that. Andrew has always felt that his girls should be senior members of the royal family, be treated as such and have uh, titles to go along with that. I think this shows a difference in attitude between the siblings. Anne is a no-nonsense, get-on-with-it sort of woman. She is royal, she has the titles, and she does the work, but she's not someone who takes herself too seriously. Andrew, her brother, I think, feels very entitled. He wants the adulation. And I don't think she does. Prescient decision. We know that Prince Charles wants the future ahead to be a slimmed down royal family. Not too many extraneous members of the monarchy. But Princess Anne was there decades before him. Anne may have been notoriously private, but eventually details of her private life did spill out into the open. Rumours swirled of issues within Anne's marriage. And leaked letters suggested a third party's involvement. No, I have no comment to make on the news at all.
As she turns 70, Princess Anne has long enjoyed a reputation as one of the most tireless members of the royal family. With close links to over 300 charities, organizations, and military groups, every year she takes part in hundreds of engagements. On this occasion, I'm marginally better organized than usual. I just left my voice behind. She has an amazing energy and a real commitment and passion about the work that she does. She's absolutely committed to those charities, and there are very many of them. The only royal coming close in this regard is her older brother, Prince Charles. Oh, to be young. <laughs> Last year, he just pipped her to the title of hardest working royal, undertaking 521 outings compared to his sister's 506. For much of her life, it's been hard for her not to be overshadowed by the older brother destined to be king. Good view in the end, I suppose. It's character building, I suppose. All their lives, comparisons have been inevitable. Charles is quite a, a sensitive man. I think we all know that he feels things quite deeply. He thinks very deeply. He's philosophical. And he cares a great deal. And I'm not saying that Anne is uncaring, but she's much more like her father, which is a pragmatist. I mean, Philip once said that um, I'm a pragmatist, Charles is a romantic, and very often a romantic thinks that a pragmatist is unfeeling. I don't think Anne is unfeeling, but she is a much more practical, get it done sort of individual than Charles, who feels things very, very deeply. The difference between her and Charles, I think, she was tougher than him. She was always stronger than him. In fact, someone once said, you know, she's the king we never had. <laughs> but Anne hasn't only found herself being compared to Charles. In the 1980s, when he married Diana, they were like never before. From where she sat, here was a woman who had worked incredibly hard all of her royal life. And she saw Diana and Fergie come into the scene. And they were splashed over the papers every day, not always for the hard work they, they'd done, often for their antics and their silliness and their, their messing about. And Anne was upset about that. She had started her charitable life with um, Save the Children. Diana worked for the Red Cross. You know, within, within a year of Diana working for the Red Cross, she was hailed a saint, a heroine. You know, people were thanking her and saying how wonderful she was. And Anne resented that. If you want to improve the lot of children, then you must improve the lot of their mothers. When Diana started her charity work, it was her hands-on approach that caught the eye and was in stark contrast to that of her sister-in-law. She might not be like Diana, she might not be about hugs and cuddles and compassion, but she is about duty and responsibility and hard work. And I think as old-fashioned a concept as that might be, I think that's why we like her. It wasn't just in this area that the likes of Diana overshadowed Anne. Amidst all the royal scandals involving her siblings and their partners, Anne emerged untainted. And yet she's not without her own misdemeanors. She received her first speeding fine when she was 20, and she's gone on to get several more. She was even banned from driving for a month in 1990. It's also often forgotten that Anne remains the only senior royal to have a criminal record. In 2002, she pleaded guilty to charges that her dog Dorothy, an English bull terrier, bit children in a park. Convicted under the Dangerous Dogs Act, she was fined £500. In 1989, Anne was again the victim of a crime when private letters were stolen from her briefcase in Buckingham Palace. Ultimately, they revealed her own romantic indiscretions while still married to Mark Phillips. Alone today at her Gloucestershire home, Gatwick Park, the Princess Royal has said nothing about the letters stolen from Buckingham Palace. No one quite knew what to make of it, but it transpired very quickly. Um, in fact, the, the palace issued a statement saying that these were letters uh, from Timothy Lawrence, who was the Queen's equerry at the time, um, to Anne. And it became very obvious very quickly, though we didn't get the content of the letters, that these were love letters and uh, that there was, uh, there was something going on uh, between the two of them. Uh, I have no comment to make on the news at all. 
it transpired when we all stay every weekend. And when we all went there to talk to the neighbors, they quite gaily said, oh yes, she's been coming for months. And, and we all said, well, why didn't you say anything? And they, they didn't because they liked her. As for the letter thief, Scotland Yard's Serious Crime Squad investigated the incident for four months. They took 500 sets of fingerprints and interviewed almost everyone at the palace, but the thief was never identified. The damage was done. The letters had exposed Anne's affair and revealed the true state of her marriage. Speculation was rife that her and Mark Phillips would be divorced, even though she denied it. In the end, divorce did come during the Queen's Annus Horribilis in 1992. Her daughter might have been the first of the Queen's children to divorce, but it never affected Anne's reputation as much as the others. Her siblings, their marriages fell apart and the world followed every last detail rapturously. We were absolutely riveted by the gory details of their marriages falling apart. Anne's, she managed to keep very private. The love letters were published, but she just kept on and she said nothing and no one dared to ask her anymore. And she married Tim Lawrence very shortly after she divorced Mark Phillips. 1992 even ended on a happy note. The Princess Royal marrying Timothy Lawrence at one of the most low-key royal weddings there's been. So she married at the little church near Balmoral, and that was probably the kind of wedding that she'd have had the first time round, if she had the chance. Small, private, you know, 30 guests for a meal afterwards. She didn't wear a floor-length dress or a veil, just, you know, a little bunch of white flowers in her hair. Had both her children there. I think that wedding was really all about Princess Anne. Since then, Princess Anne has maintained her ferocious commitment to royal duty. Her no-nonsense dedication to carrying out her role is a trait she shares with her mother. It's led many to wonder if Anne was the Queen's child most suited to becoming the next monarch. At 70, Princess Anne is as energetic in her commitment to the royal family as ever. In March 2020, she was at Paddington Station... <laughs>
one person with a better insight into Anne than most is Katie Nichol. She recently interviewed the princess to mark her 70th birthday. I think growing up with three brothers, it was inevitable that Anne was going to be pretty tough, pretty resilient. She had to learn from an early stage how to hold her own as a girl in the royal family, second born to Charles. And, you know, I think there was a lot of competition between the siblings. So Anne was always going to have to stake out her own role in the royal family. The princess had to become independent from an early age. She was not even three years old when her mother became queen in 1952.